welcome to the Free Cities podcast. My name is Timothy Allen, and this is the official podcast of the Free Cities Foundation. Hello, and welcome to episode number 65 of the Free Cities podcast. Well, I'm recording this in the bitingly cold city of Ulaanbaatar. Um, It's a balmy minus 17 degrees C outside at the moment. And I say balmy because I've just noticed that BBC Weather is reporting a low of minus 38 on Monday. Truth be told, I love it really. These expeditions certainly serve an important purpose for me and the people that I bring, inserting just enough hardship into the convenience of our lives back home. Well, for me at least, enough to keep me sane. I know from many years of experience that I need physical hardships in my life, and if they won't come naturally, I'll make them happen. Well, these kind of trips come at a price, and risk is one component of that. And this week's guest is someone who knows a lot about risk. Dr. Mark Felix Otto is partner and chairman of the Advisory House, a renowned strategy and management consultancy serving the European energy industry. His expertise includes risk management for major energy trading organizations. And fortunately for us, he's also a council member of the Free Cities Foundation, who's been advocating for free cities for more than 20 years. In this conversation, we talk about political risk management and the broader subject of geopolitics in the context of what is known as the fourth turning. Listen on to find out what that is if you don't already know. We also talk about free city vulnerabilities, monetary reset, and dive into a few of the more prominent conspiracy theories involving world governance. Don't forget to sign up to the Free Cities Foundation's Telegram group for all the latest chat. And I have to say many thanks to everyone who has been donating to help produce our new film about special economic zones. We really appreciate all the support. Um, quite astonished about how many people have been donating and if you've only just heard about this and you want to donate please look at the show notes for links and yes of course we do accept bitcoin come to think of it you could probably even donate some gold too if you like don't want to leave anyone out Um, but i will leave the logistics of that up to yourself anyway Whilst you contemplate that, I would just urge you, please, to sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Mark Felix Otto. I mean, to be honest, um, I think you... You reside in a world that's pretty alien to me, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. I mean, I, I've, I googled your um, your bio, and I don't really understand how you, you, you know how you fit in because I know little about that world at all. So, I, what I wouldn't mind actually in the beginning is if you could explain to me in really layman's terms what you do and where you do it, if you know <laughs> what I mean, because. It is. I, I can read all the words and I can understand. And but but I, I'm more interested to know how where that happens. Who do you who do you risk manage with? Mm-hmm. You know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, I uh, am a equity partner at the advisory house, and we focus on the European energy industry. So if you use power, you know what we do, <laughs> because we are um, helping companies that produce power. To become more efficient, to be uh, strategically robust, whatever. And um, a, um, a certain focus is on risk management. Yeah. And then I figured, um, or I, I pondered how to connect um, my professional life with a 
<laughs> with my hobby. <laughs> I, sit on, where I sit on the board of the Free Cities Foundation. No, hobby is not the wrong, not 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 the correct word. It's it's a <clears throat> it's my passion, um, and um, yeah, and uh, the natural connection is uh, the the insight that the state um, the state causes a risk to companies in uh, that they change the the rules of the game. Yeah, they legislate, and um, yeah, that's uh, why I thought about a specific work on management of political risk. Then I did all the investigation, what's already been written, etc. And I think uh, I could address quite a wide patch. But in your in your normal life, hmm. <laughs> uh, in your sort of risk management in the energy sector, what kind of risk are we talking about here? Pol is there, I mean, presumably there's a political element to that. Yeah. You know, don't look for oil in this place because it's politically unstable. Or, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. and, and that's with oil and also with gas. You're correct. The geopolitical component has always been on the top of the agenda. <clears throat> but yet there hasn't been a, in my view, a comprehensive method to address this uh, what 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 companies always do is they they think in terms of scenarios and that's okay it's the best you can do um, when it comes to geopolitical risk probably um, because you don't understand um, the players all the players involved etc so you just out of your head you intuit some scenarios and and it puts some likelihood to them and etc um, what i try to do now is to um, use all the tools that have been developed in generic risk management over the last centuries <laughs> or the last decades, let's say, and um, and apply them to this uh, specific category of political risk. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, I I'd, I still want to build up a good picture of how you manage risk in your other life like well, my, is this correct so i'm going to imagine it's something along the lines of you do studies you send out fact finding missions yeah. you do this that and the other and then you present an oil uh, an energy company with mm. a, uh, a risk management plan right is yeah. that right yeah 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 and more specifically, risk management is very well established in energy trading. That's where you basically manage most of the risk, uh, the short-term, mid-term risk. And in, in energy trading, what you usually have is liquid uh, liquid commodity markets for oil, gas, power, you name it. And um, <clears throat> from these markets, you can derive a huge amount of data and do statistical analysis, etc., but uh, political risk is human driven and um, the human free will <laughs> is not is not well uh, or not easy to investigate through through statistics and and that's where this comes in and the connection between your former life and the free cities world mm. how did that come about my formal my professional life oh you're yeah. sorry former mm. life yeah, yeah. Your professional life <laughs> still there yeah I'm, maybe i'm preempting that yeah. somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> no, you ain't um <clears throat> actually the the libertarian uh uh passion uh preceded my professional life i i jumped or i <laughs> dove into that during when, when i did my phd thesis also the reason why i didn't stay in physics because i figured that Almost all of uh, the jobs I could take on would have been with the state, um, like university jobs or whatever, in, in, in science. And then I changed uh, from physics discipline to management consulting. I started with McKinsey and Company. That's like 20, 21 years back. And um, from there, I yeah moved on to the advisory house, etc. But political risk is the most relevant risk, is it, in the Free Cities movement? Yeah. Uh, is there any other elements of your professional life which mm. fit in here? <laughs> well, generically, in, in management consulting, you think in terms of company value, so you can think also in terms of society value, blah, blah. You can, you can probably translate a couple of concepts. But I figure that, that since I'm a risk management expert, if you like, yeah, that this is the discipline which I have to dive into. And, and then I, I read the literature and it focused only on, on political risk. The systematic literature focuses so, focused so far only on political risk in, in third world, in, in developing countries. No book on, no comprehensive works on uh, political risk in developed, yeah, in industrial countries. Is that anything to do with the fact that people trust yeah. their governments in exactly. these places, is it? Yeah. Yes, it is. And um, Is that something you've seen change in recent times? Yes. 
even from can you can you measure that or is that mm. is that anecdotally i couldn't measure it no it, these are anecdotes but um when when you talk to senior management in the companies um you you feel that uh, the, the level of trust towards the government has, has eroded over the last 10 15 years starting maybe with lehman brothers um and you know the breaking of the rules in Europe, we had the breaking of the um, Euro stability rules, Maastricht Treaty, etc., and this set in motion a couple of other developments. And yes, yeah, so I think people are are more open to considering political risk as such, and not just as a, a regulatory risk, things that I have to comply with. Yeah, compliance management is a well-established pe- discipline, but this is only one potential avenue of, of, of uh, dealing with political risk, obviously. Yeah, you could also try to avert it or try to, uh, or you can, you can move away. You can move to a different jurisdiction part or all of your company, etc., etc. And all those avenues I, I hope to lay out systematically in my work. Well, let's talk about the book then, because, it's, I mean, the book is purely on political risk. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. So how have you structured the book then? Like, what are the, mm. how, how do you begin? I mean, I can see it from here. It's, it's, it's big enough. It's yeah. thick enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how do you structure a, 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 a thing like that? And certainly in this day and age. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> there's a balance between, um, yeah, there's a balance between um, being compatible with the mainstream. And I um, consciously, chose a very mainstream editor, Springer. Um, Springer is also the, the um, editor of the Nature magazine, as you might know, and is one of the leading <clears throat> science editors in the world, I think. And uh, but, 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 but they acted, I, I mean, they were very friendly. And I have in the book, I, yeah, yeah, I actually, <clears throat> I recommend to look also at, uh, yeah, uh, alternative jurisdictions like free cities or yeah, international communities, etc., because there you might have a different type or, or lower level of political risk. How did I structure or how did I structure the book? First, I, I lay out um, a definition. What, what do I deal with? We don't want to deal with um, risk that is caused by individual, maybe political actors, like people, yeah, corrupt people who threaten your company or something like that. We focus only on political risk in the inner sense, meaning the risk which is inherent to the state. Yeah, um, Why is the that laws. There? Yeah, because otherwise you deal with criminality. And if, <clears throat> if I mean, this... But isn't that, yeah. isn't that an inherent part of political risk? I mean, yeah. politics by its nature attracts certain types of people, let's say, <laughs> to, to high positions. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but once they really break the law, um, they usually, in, in, in developed nations, I, I still think that there is a very good case to be made to, so that you can follow the rule of law and, and yeah, um, get rid of the challenge through the normal avenues. But you cannot get rid of the challenge of, of uh, the, the rules of the game changing, right? Um, that's inherent, and you have to to understand what to do with it. And the um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the the higher the sovereign debt <laughs> level, I think the higher uh, the risk of of the jurisdiction exploding, di- diverging from from a, let's say a healthy path. So the second chapter is about the definitions. Then in the third chapter, I review <coughs> or revisit. Um, the, uh, all the tools, or the, all the relevant tools from generic risk management, and then I, in, from chapters four to seven, I apply them to political risk and end up with a, I hope, for, I hope, quite complete uh, set of potential avenues, potential options uh, for action. And uh, I specifically dive into the option to um, become geographically flexible, to, yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, Not put all your eggs in one jurisdictional basket, so to speak. A couple of questions that instantly spring to mind. Is is anyone else writing books on political risk? Yeah, I think I mentioned it in the beginning. Um, the literature on political risk, there there is a literature starting in the 19, late 70s, early 80s in the Anglo-Saxon sphere primarily. But the 100% focus was on investment risk in, in developing economies okay and you can insure against this through in, in the us for example there are agencies you can insure and then of course yeah and, and what do they do i mean at the end of the day they have means of influencing those weak governments in those third world countries 
Um, when it comes to Europe, for example, European states, no, there hasn't been a book about it. So All right, far. then. Well, let's, let, why don't we go into, number one, the main risks, and then mm. number two, the main options. Yeah. So in, and, and presumably, like, like you said earlier, these main risks, these are a c contemporary mm. phenomenon. Oh, yes. Uh, is that to say they were never around or that they've only mm. just really started rearing their head recently? Well, you, you might know this book, The Fourth Turning yeah, by I do. Strauss and Howie. Very much. And so. maybe they have been around 80 years ago. Right. And okay. now we are again in a fourth turning and that's why things become more drastic. Hmm, that might be the case, or maybe it's just, um, yeah. Well, it's it's uh, political risk is not so easy to quantify. What you can quantify is the impact on on the national economy as a whole. And I think in that regard, certainly, yeah, all those inflation measures, for example, or sovereign debt, we, we have a couple of indicators signif raising the alarm about political risk, hmm. and. Um, What what the major one? The major one is that your yeah that, that, that the business that your company's business model uh, gets undermined. Yeah, uh, one of my clients owns a share of Nord Stream, uh, one, oh. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, and then uh, this company was nationalized and um, <clears throat> by by the German government, and so it's it's a real back and forth. <laughs> And this hasn't happened before, not not like this, yeah, not in this severeness, severity. So um, presumably that comes under the main heading of governments changing the rules at short yeah. notice without really oh, yeah. consulting you. Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, is that the main risk in government, put full yeah. stop? Yeah, in, in the industrialized world, I think so. Um, that the legislative, all, the, the whole bundle of legislative risks, and they can affect every part of your balance sheet, of your business model, of your profit and loss statement, yeah? Um, you can, they, they can change the rules about the um, technologies you're allowed to use, about the products you're allowed to produce, about the customers you're allowed to have, about, yeah, and basically everything. And um, in, let's say, more normal times, in first, second, or third, third turning, um, Most of the things don't happen, but in the fourth turning, everything seems to be up. And yeah. is that also a symptom of the centralization of mm. the state? I mean, in, you know, take the EU, for example. Yep. You know, before the EU, there were a number of different decision-making processes which are now mm. coming all under the one umbrella. And I would imagine that disenfranchises far more people than the decentralized mm. version. Yeah. Yeah, also because the decentralized version uh, has more competition, of course, bec between the entities, so it somehow maybe dampens uh, their ambitions. And uh, the EU, I think, is a quite an undampened <laughs> version of, of the central state, indeed. Um, but it's not only the EU, also, I think, in other parts of the world, we, we see um, drastic measures being taken. Yeah, and that's, that's where... Um, the alternative jurisdiction movement or whatever you want to, to call it comes in because um, there are still quite stable jurisdictions um, worldwide, yeah, Dubai, Singapore, maybe Switzerland within Europe is, is relatively stable still. And um, <clears throat> that is well known, of course. Uh, you can also play the text game regarding different jurisdictions. Um, but at the end of the day, I argue in the book that, that the best thing that you can do is have a business model which allows you to be flexible and to move pretty quickly, maybe uh, to to have a good radar um, about political developments and then move move to a different jurisdiction before the worst um, has come to pass. Why do you think it is that somewhere like Dubai is, as you put it, stable? What, what is it about the Dubai rule, rulers which, which makes it stable? That's a good question. Maybe they're not in the first, fourth turning. Their business model is still attractive and, and they're successful and earning money through low taxes and, and bringing great people, yeah, uh, the negative brain drain, so to speak, yeah, brain, brain inflow um, uh, game. And maybe, of, mm, maybe, sorry to put in, yeah. but maybe we, you should lay out what the fourth turning the theory of the fourth yeah. turning is because i'm almost certain there's a few people listening going what's the fourth turning yeah yeah i'm, I'm not an expert on i know on this, the, but the general uh, what i took away, yeah what i read in the book is that um 
Strauss and Howey argue that uh, you have uh, human generations roughly 20 years. So um, you have um, <clears throat> a human life is like four generations or four turnings, yeah, four times 20 years, 80 years long. And um, what they um, what they investigate is the uh, history of the United States of America. And they see that like every 70 to 90, uh, 80 years, um, Uh, there's, there has been a crisis, be it the Civil War or uh, the World Wars. And uh, the Second World War ended in 45. And uh, yeah, so two years from now, <laughs> we moved 80, 80 years on. And why, um, why might it be that, that uh, the probability for, for crisis to happen increases? Well, maybe in my view, the most important factor might be that the people who lived through that crisis, they have died. And uh, maybe on the one hand, there might be a hunger in, a, in, in the human mind to um, experience a crisis once in your lifetime. Or it might simply be that uh, since nobody knows how, how bad it can be, um, they are less, um, yeah, <laughs> less prudent. Um, I don't know, but it, it seems yeah, there is something to it. And of well, course, if, you, that, mm, if yeah. you look at the crises on the whole, it's there's obviously a propensity in humans to have these crises, and they they are normally power struggles when you when oh, yeah. you look at them. So Absolutely. that's obvious, and I think it's true as well that, like you say, every eighty years, a whole generation has forgotten mm. about the last crisis. So the propensity is more inherently likely to happen at that point because yeah. no one's warning you that don't do that. I've lived through that, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what, what, what do they currently think that what is the current crisis then according mm. to you? Oh, <laughs> is it political risk? I mean, I mean, oh. uh, no, no, risk is the outflow, uh, the outcome of, of the crisis. But I mean, the uh, crisis the is political origins mm. are in the p political yeah. sphere. As you said, uh, it's probably a power struggle, and and who are the parties to the struggle? Maybe on, I, I'm, <laughs> I think it, it's 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 fluid, yeah. But um, you might look at it in terms of the Western elite against um, BRICS on the one hand side, on the one, one hand, and, or against um, the internal opposition um, on the other hand. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, we are used to, I think in the Western world, we are used to seeing this Western elite, if you want to call it that, as a superior. But when you combine all their <laughs> their enemies if you like yeah, like the, the mighty BRICS nations and the, the quite strong opposition which um, achieves 40 50 percent uh, in the elections already um, then maybe uh, they're on the decline and they're with their back to the, against the wall and yeah all those great things that they could do for, in their point of view that they could do in the past like change the rules and enrich themselves etc that becomes harder for them Is it um, in 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 your day job? Is the fourth turning a, a commonly understood thing? No, not at all. No, no. In Europe, it isn't. No, I don't know about the US. It's a it, niche. Yeah. It's a niche thing, right? It's not seeping into the mainstream. Either. No, and <laughs> I had a hard time acknowledging that there might be something like um, social psychology. Yeah. Um, I have a physics background after all, and you cannot probably you cannot really measure these things. Yeah, historical developments. That of course you can have a crisis also within a second or third turning, but right now everything everybody talks about crisis has been talking about crisis for the last I don't know 15 years, maybe starting with 9/11, um, and. Uh, Yeah, sometimes it seems like people are hungry for this crisis. They are really, yeah, yearning for something to happen, something to break, something to change. Yeah, because also maybe because they are bored with the status quo, might also be a reason. Or that um, the I mean, I often look at um, the ebb and flow of centralized and decentralized mm -hmm. entities as as a bit like a pendulum. Oh yeah, you know, and. There's, you can see we're heading in the direction of centralization at the moment. So there has to be some kind of pushback. It's a very yeah. natural occurrence. And I know plenty of people who are, have come up against the idea of the centralization of power recently, who yeah. never would have cared less about that. And 
Um, I think that's the natural result of this centralization of power is it creates people who go, wait a minute, that, that, mm. that I'm losing liberty here. I'm losing yeah. my freedom here. This, yeah. this isn't something that I want to happen. Therefore, I will invent this, say this, push back here, do whatever. You know. Absolutely. That's one pendulum. And even among the power freaks, if you like, um, this pendulum might swing back and somebody like Xi in China... Uh, <clears throat> considers that maybe he has less power when when he fully integrates in, into the WEF agenda <laughs> and yeah rather takes his buddy Putin and, and uh, <laughs> yeah opposes um, this big world government push yeah. you, I mean you, you, you're so you think I mean maybe I, I should think about some predictions a bit later on let's let's stick to what we were talking about that which was um, main risks mm. um are there any more currently oh yeah we talked about legislative risks um that's legislative executive or um judiciary risks that's one um <clears throat> manner of breaking it down you could also break down the risks along your balance sheet and then you have um expropriation risk as opposed to risk to your future cash flows etc um overall i think political risk be it um Uh, endogenous, I mean national or uh, local or geopolitical international risk. Um, it has been on the rise over the last 15 years, I think, and it has become critical and, and the time is ripe to, to consider it in detail and to consider your options. Can I ask you, you're speaking obviously at the conference here, how are you framing political risk to a free cities crowd? Mm. Because we're pretty... You know, we pretty we pretty know what the <laughs> political yeah. risk is. It's them coming in and t shutting it down. Is that yeah. right? Is there any more to it than that? I mean, look, how do you make a how do you how do you create a whole speech out of out of political risk? Yeah, I argue um, that a, the the free cities movement or the free cities concept with a citizenship contract might be a means to uh, minimize. Uh, at least the endogenous part of political risk. Um, yeah, in this within the society, if the contract still holds, um, you have very little political risk. Probably the, the main political risk is the mother state or some external actor coming in and <clears throat> breaking up the whole society. But uh, other than that, if you have uh, a contract-based or private law society, that might minimize uh, political risk. That's where the connection comes in. Um, and then I argue, well, we are always talking about um, setting up projects. We are always talking about the settler um, dimension, but we should absolutely think about the company dimension. These are entities that have a lot of resources and uh, can can absolutely <clears throat> propel or yeah um, strengthen our movement. Have you been? I presume you've been watching what's going on in Prospera pretty closely. Yeah. How, what's your take on that? Because they are now hmm. coming up against political risk face on, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. That's the, uh, <laughs> the so mother what, scenario. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a very interesting test case. Yeah, because, absolutely. Um, so how, how, what's your opinion and how do you view it and what, what do you think might happen? Yeah, I, I fear that my, my view is not very original here. But when you look at the polls, um, the, the current socialist uh, party, governing party is... Uh, pretty much down I think um, and I think the next elections are due in one and a half or two years time so if uh, the Zidis survive until then I think there's a good chance that they will be around for a lot longer. What, what about your view on the way they are insulating themselves from political risk as in their legal framework do, do you know much about how that's working out? Mm. I mean it seems to be working put it that way. Yeah yeah no I'm I'm not so closely involved. Do you write it? anything mm. about um, that aspect of, I mean, that's obviously a, that's an option you've got yeah. to, to mitigate political risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also for a large company, it probably doesn't make sense to put all your eggs in one Prospera or Morazan basket, but um, at least have a, have a representation there. And then the ability to move other parts of your company or abilities or people to move them to, to a safer jurisdiction. Yeah, and yeah, I mean these Zedes in Honduras are just one one example. Um, you can have. Does it deal with individuals as well? 
yep. I mean, me as an mm-hmm. individual, someone looking for freedom, mm-hmm. or, or not, not looking for a free life. I just yeah. want to be left alone. Yeah. Obviously, so and in this current world we live in, I think wanting to be left alone, mm-hmm. um, that um, puts you up against political risk, basically. Mm. Sure. <laughs> because for, some, for, for whatever reason, mm. forth turning, whatever, politicians don't want to leave you alone at the moment. So what, what are my strategies then as a, an individual? Mm. Uh, that, that's absolutely a valid question. I think that has been the, this question has been the focus of the of our discussion for, for f- from the beginning yeah um, how, how to avoid um, what we experience right now and and this is where I think I uh, might add a, <clears throat> a piece to the discussion in focusing on companies only of course I mean companies are made up of people and maybe yeah some <laughs> non-living entities the assets whatever machines etc intellectual property but um, the people dimension also is very very in important when it comes to flexibilization um, you need to motivate your people to move along or you have to make them redundant if they're absolutely stuck to the uh, failing jurisdiction um, yeah so i address this part but it's not about individual liberty really um the, the topic of managing political risk from from the point of view of a company you can read this book or large parts of this book from an individual perspective as well all those parts that address uh, how do political risks come about how how to how to address them um but when it comes to the specific measures um yeah yeah as a, as an individual um you probably don't don't command a set of 100, 200, 1,000, 2,000 people, right? Um, what do you um, write about how political risks come about mm. then? Are you talking about from a, beha- you know, from yeah. a sort of human psyche mm-hmm. perspective here? I mean, how do we spot the places where political risk exactly. might How involve? do we identify the political risks? That, that, that's a core question. And A... Um, Pretty simply, you can just um, learn from history, A, and, and B, look at the current development. Uh, usually, um, legislation takes its time, um, yeah, <clears throat> even even in turbulent times as ours, um, a new law takes at least a couple of, of weeks, typically months, often years, uh, to, yeah, um, to be effective, and um, that's enough time, usually, in order for, for a company to prepare and to react. Um, <clears throat> You can look at the whole um, forest of existing laws and how they might change. Um, also in different jurisdictions, you have probably quite a good set of, of potential potential um, laws that come about in your own ju- jurisdiction or your main jurisdiction. Um, yeah, and then you have to understand uh, the, the process, the legal process, for example, or the um, political process um, in your country. And then you probably have quite a good uh, starting point uh, to develop your scenarios. So using sort of sources from history, let's say, you said, you know, study historical Mm -hmm. precedents. Um, What do you think are the most, the biggest free city vulnerabilities currently then? Like, because we, we don't really have any historical versions i mean we do uh, go, we could go back to venice mm-hmm. and say that was a real success but i mean are you are you talking about why did venice fail or why did the medieval city states disappear mm. or why you know uh, you know what what are the big i mean what are the biggest vulnerabilities of free cities according to you mm. Mm. Yeah, I think we have a tendency to uh, to build theories around historical developments. Maybe at the end of the day, it's just human free will. And if there are in- enough um, people, um, able people to prevent uh, the, the tendency towards centralization and politicization of, 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 the, of life, then, then things develop differently. Why did Venice lose its power? Ah. Oh. Yeah, I'm not an expert, but um, the Hanse in Germany was basically swallowed um, by the national state later on, and uh, before that already it it, it was weakened uh, through um, measures by the different states where, where the cities um, <clears throat> uh, were in. 
And uh, but also, I just read this novel by uh, Friedrich Schiller, William Tell, um, about about Switzerland and the Swiss freedom movement in in the 13th century. And you could argue that this is quite a successful case of a country relatively decentralized. Yeah, and uh, you can learn also from su successful cases. And at the end of the day, um, this uh, German. Uh, empire with all those little fiefdoms and, and kingdoms and, and you, you name it, free cities, uh, free empire, empirical cities, Freie Reichsstädte. Um, this lasted quite a long while, yeah, quite a long time, like let's say from 800 to maybe Westphalia, 1600, so almost, yeah, eight, eight centuries. Hmm. Why, did they, why did they decline in the end? Were they absorbed? By yeah, they. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, they were absorbed. I think um, into into the German national state in, in the nineteenth century um, at last. Before that, of course, um, it became apparent that that France was winning, so to speak. France expanded um, to the east um, because these little fiefdoms were not strong enough to defend themselves, and then they united militarily. And at the end of the day, there, there was one national state. Of course, that's always a, the problem when you have a small entity. I think you're very competitive um, when it comes to attracting individuals, but uh, you're not very competitive when it comes to defending your territory against a huge um, <clears throat> uh, enemy, a bigger, a larger enemy. Um, but then it can, it's not, yeah, this is not linear. History is not linear. And uh, it always comes down to individuals um, with specific abilities or vision and luck, maybe. Yeah, well, yeah, for sure. I mean, <clears throat> I agree, it's, it's not linear, but like we've alluded mm. to earlier, it doesn't seem to move in cycles, yeah. which do seem to repeat themselves. As mm. well. I think when when I came into the free cities world, I think for, for, for a long time I was, I understood the theory and I accepted the theory as good and true, but I didn't imagine it would come to pass because, you know, it is an unusual thought to have that maybe one day in a hundred years' time there might be a bundle of decentralized states over Europe again. Mm. Um, but presumably, how do, you, how do you feel about that prospect? I mean, what, do you feel that's a real life, you know, is, 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 that, is that really going to happen? Is that something that, are we, are, we, are, we, are we thinking it would be great if it happens? Or yeah. is, is this actually going to happen? Because it, it appears that it might, because if you look at the cycle we're in, we're, we're, pe we're peaking at the sort of centralized end of the cycle mm -hmm. right now. That's what mm -hmm. it appears. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe it's our responsibility to make it happen. <laughs> I agree, agreed. Yeah, but, yeah. but once again, it's like, you know, in a way, like, you know, it's been at least 80 years since there was a, a decentralized network of, of city states for sure. And I certainly don't have any recollection of it except, except from the history books. Mm. So it is hard to imagine that it could actually happen when you live a hundred percent of your life in a world of states and uh, currently of states getting larger and larger as yes. well. They, they don't recede. Um, That's true. So is it, is it going to happen? I mean, you know, but risk I, I, I risk analyze know. it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm not. But presumably not, not it sure must happen. Was, but, yeah. but presumably it must happen. Think about it. What is the end game of centralization? Yeah, one world government where there's only one emperor, one huge ruler, and all the other power freaks report into him. And I cannot imagine this to come about. Well, even we, if it there's so come many. About. Yeah, even if it did, like when is it ever? lasted forever yeah yeah when yeah. in history you can you can watch star wars and see the rebels um yeah uh, <laughs> excel due to uh, sheer I but, mean, I creativity mean, and all, motivation uh, all, all, i mean mostly at least but for all different for different reasons hmm. the, the this the bigger the state gets in the end it does collapse under its own weight yeah, yeah. and one of the Absolutely. one of the only differences now with what's happening in the world, other than the fact it's now the kind of the super state, it's not you know states, is they do have interesting technology at their disposal, and um, yeah, it is slightly worrying. I think that oh, you yeah. could have because the the the, uh, the existence of algorithms now means that the state can scale rather large without mm. collapsing under its own weight, which was, I think was one of, one of the big problems with, with the state before, is it could never find enough people to enforce its rules. 
True, but you don't need the, the, the people so much now. That's, that's, that's correct. All of that is correct. But then technology is always a, a two-sided sword, dual-use concept. And uh, maybe we have um, already harvested lots of the fruit from um, the new technology in terms of, of, of liberty, right? We, we have uh, completely open channels for communication, uh, very, very cheap um, means um, to, to communicate across the whole globe etc um, we have uh, we have bitcoin and 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 um, so we have probably harvested many fruit and now the state is slower when, it's, when it comes to adapting new technology in general maybe not in the military domain but apart from that i think that it is slower and now it is adapting and, and yeah um, <clears throat> that, that is quite threatening true But then again, I mean, technology will move on and we have to adapt quickly. Yeah. I, really, when, when, when I read history, um, I always have the feeling that, so, that there was so much uh, maybe luck or bad luck and uh, coincidence, yeah? just randomness or people with visions and abilities. It's, it's, you cannot really predict things. Yeah, there are tendencies and turnings, and maybe you have uh, even larger cycles, um, not not 80 year cycles, but I don't know, two, three, four hundred year cycles um, of technology, and we are now in a new, um, yeah, uh, Gutenberg printing machine cycle, um, where the empire strikes back, and um, but in the end we will have <laughs> separation of church and state, yeah, and separation of of state and. Um, The theological uh, concept um, behind it. So you think we're just no. entering the Empire Strikes Back? Mm. What? Well, yeah. Wait a minute, but that was number three, right? In the Star Wars? Five, I think. No, well, sorry, the old, I'm talking about when I was a little yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was a kid. I think the second one. The, <laughs> What is the second one? Ep, ep, yeah, I think that the Empire Strikes Back. The return, sorry, the Return of the Jedi, right. So the Return of the Jedi is third, the third yeah, one. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah mm -hmm. but that means we're entering the quite dark phase. I yeah. mean, the, the, the Empire Strikes Back was the dark chapter in that trilogy. Of course, of course. So you think we're just entering it? I thought we no. were deeply in it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, when I mean we harvested the fruit, I'm talking about the last 30 years and for the last maybe 15 or 20 years, uh, the empire tries to stri st strike back and with climate uh, angst and with COVID angst, I think they landed a couple of of wins already before that with uh, uh, terrorism. I think they they won a lot of contracts um, through wars in, in the Middle East. We didn't, uh, yeah, that didn't, it didn't affect us as much in, in, in the Western world. But um, in that world, it was pretty drastic, I think. And now everything can come together. And you have uh, the World Health Organization on the one hand and the Ukraine war and now the Middle, uh, new Middle East war, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you have the sovereign deficits. Um, yeah. Do you... The billions. What do you think about the... Is, it, is, is this a conspiracy or is this just... Uh, an, uh, the, uh, this is human nature playing out on a large scale. Mm. Like, because it's yeah. very easy to look at COVID, the examples you gave COVID and think so, COVID was just something that happened. Yeah. The result was the state got more powerful, but it was, no one was sitting uh, in an office going, ha, 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 we can make this. Now we can, you know, there's no Darth Vader. Or, no. What's his name? Or is there? I mean, I, I, I veer between one and the other. Sometimes I think it's pure incompetence. Other times I think it's, it, it is contrived in some way, you know. Yeah, I doubt that that there are people making such long-term plans as, as some other people suggest. Um, but I, I, I'm I'm pretty confident that some corporate uh, entities were were uh, happy to sell vaccines um, without uh, having to carry um, the the product um, the risk. Yeah, um, great. Great, absolutely great. I mean, I, I think in the US it was the same thing, right? Um, they were completely uh, redeemed from yeah, yeah no. liabilities. Yes. Great. So I make a lot of money. And in order to do that, if I have to influence public opinion a little bit here and there, I'm used to it. This is called lobbying. Yeah, it's part of my... I even have a, a corporate unit for that, a large corporate unit. So no, no horror big boss at the top 
<laughs> pulling the strings, just a, a bunch of incentives. Uh, there might be a couple of people who consider themselves to be the top guy, yeah? like the president of the United States or uh, the president of the World Health Organization or the president of the World Economic Forum. All these things, pro these people probably believe um, they're, they're the largest gorilla in the room, but Well, there can only be one largest gorilla in the room. And no, I don't think that they report into each or one person. There are many, many people earning money out of wars or COVID fear or climate fear, of course. Yeah. And, and wherever there is money to earn, of course, people move in that direction. Like the sunflower moves in the direction of the or, sun. right? Or, or maybe even just power. And yeah, yeah. The absolutely. Money is the manifestation of oh, it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because absolutely. the turnings are power, like oh, yeah. we discussed earlier. I think if, 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 the, if the turnings are real, mm. which it's a very compelling um, theory because it has a lot of data to show, yeah. um, then it would be that, that these are power. This is the, the natural cycle of power. Yes, yes, absolutely. No, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. I, I, the, the, the people that long for power, <clears throat> they do. They might do so even if they lose money in the process. Yeah, and um, on yes, and but they will struggle. Um, I think they will struggle um, to construct a large hierarchy simply because they want to have power over others and they don't want to be powerless as opposed to their yeah, superiors. And um, so this is quite an just this this power drug. I think creates doesn't create a lot of stability. Yeah, it doesn't create a, a stable architecture of or a hierarchy of, of people. Whereas if you bring in the money, um, this can be um, combined. Yeah, some people at the top they just long for power, and um, then others long for money, and uh, they they co cooperate. I think it also the powerful entities that love power they they love complexity as well and that oh yeah that is very important in maintaining power mm -hmm. i think but it like you say it makes things inherently unstable as well yep. the more complex something is the, the less stable it is but I, there's something i've realized in recent years is how much complexity keeps us in our place especially mm. in the government You know, yeah. like the or or at the Federal Reserve or at the that whatever the number. As soon as you start going into any of this stuff, it's so damn complex. You give up. The structures that are in place are so complicated, or the the mm. ideas behind monetary theory, you know, are so complicated. You just like you wouldn't understand. It's just you know, don't even bother thinking about this stuff. But. Um, Like yeah, the 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 end normally is some form of collapse in my mm -hmm. experience. And do you have a an opinion on w w what might happen in the future? Mm -hmm. Because there are well, there are a few there are a few theories on how a transition mm. at the end of a fourth turning occurs. Historically, all fourth turnings have have ended in quite drastic situations. Oh yeah, right. Changes, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, no, even, but the yeah. manifestation. Revolutions. Yeah. Uh, um, wars, mm. m revolutions, whatever. Mm. Do you think it's possible to transition out of a fourth turning in a, an amicable way, more, more so than a world war, for example? Well, at the end of the day, um, if you look at, at individual persons, there are already quite a lot of people who are affected by war. So for many people, there is already a war in this force turning. Um, not for you and me, baby. Uh, we just finance it through through Texas, to Texas, unfortunately. Um, but so, will there be war? Yeah, there is already a war. Will there be a world war affecting everybody? Well, even the Second World War didn't affect exactly everybody in South America. Many people could still live their normal life, yeah, more or less. Um, so. Um, I, I really advise to think in terms of scenarios uh, rather than in terms of just one scenario. This is the one that, which will happen because you cannot predict it. It's, it's too complex and the human free will plays too important a role. But if you think in terms of, of um, yeah, um, scenarios, um, uh, placative scenarios, then there's certainly the World War III scenario on the one hand, but you, on the other hand you have a scenario where 
yeah, where the decentralization of power um, simply takes place, just like uh, the collapsing um, <clears throat> uh, Warsaw Pact, yeah, USSR, East Germany, they just collapsed under their um, inability, I think. Yeah. And, and even the rulers weren't motivated to uphold the system anymore, uh, in the USSR at least. And um, this was quite peaceful. But this is maybe the spectrum that we have between a peaceful collapse and people just don't wanting, <laughs> not not wanting to to uphold uh, their 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 silly power over um, a uh, budgetary or yeah about the deficit um, spending anymore. Whereas this, whereas this huge war, yeah, where lots of millions of people die. This is a spectrum, I guess. It, I I can't exactly remember. Um, why but i'm sh pretty sure that part of the reason why wars happen near the end of fourth turnings is to do with um the debt cycle as well is that right oh, yeah. Yeah, can absolutely. you explain yeah. that because I, i'm thinking it through now and i think i get it but if you already know it i'd prefer to hear it from you it's something along the lines of the debt cycle needs resetting because there's so much debt You need some event that causes a massive inflation mm. to devalue the currency, so the debt disappears. Is it something yeah. like that? I don't. Know. Yeah, Raim Tagizadegan and I wrote about it in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. We call it the um, <clears throat> the coercion cycle because debt, at the end of the day, um, uh, is built on trust. You wouldn't have. Yeah, there's also the word credit. Yeah, credit in, in Latin means means trust. And is also a word for for debt, hmm? uh, meaning if if you don't trust your counterparty to pay you back, you wouldn't lend him or her the money. Um, so a huge level of debt uh, presupposes a huge level of trust within the society. And uh, what can then happen is that if that trust erodes, you can have a um, an avalanche of eroding trust because um, eroding trust in the first step um, forces people to pay back because they cannot yeah, um, <clears throat> get additional loans um, or mortgages or whatever and uh, then they uh, default maybe some of them default and that erodes trust even further and then you have a very quick avalanche where everything decomposes and uh, so um, that might uh, be uh, the case why in the fourth turning often yes you ha you start with a very high level of of debt of implicit trust of used trust if you like yeah um, there might be more trust in the society than than there is credit given in terms of money and, and that's a healthy state but if all the uh, psycholo psychological trust is used up by this huge um, credit uh, organization yeah a huge amount of credit then this becomes very instable and then you have the avalanche and then everything gets reset and yes of course war is a for for power freaks is a great um, means to avoid responsibility for this of course i mean this has been written and talked about a lot at length i guess well i mean if yeah. if if they were to be believed as well a lot of people think that someone like klaus schwab hmm. knows this and is actually enacting out his duty to kind of create this scenario to make it happen hmm. or, or or someone along the lines of him someone in that sort of you know what we, we people call the elite etc do you think it's true or not do you think do you think do you think there are people out there working at the federal reserve or the world economic forum or whatever who think we need a great reset because um if we the only way to sort of like maintain our position in this system is to basically cause it to you know mm. momentarily collapse but on our terms so we basically get to sort of carry on as, as we in the next stage well obviously i don't know whether there are such people um number one number two i doubt that it's really relevant um i think um everybody needs to understand their own uh Uh, motivation or their own means of motivating themselves and for me if, if i have a superior enemy who knows everything and knows my next step that would be quite de demotivating and i i don't think there is such a thing i i worked for mckinsey and company for four years and at that time i don't know about today but at that time i think this was a company with the single highest number of delegates to the world economic forum and a new couple of people who attended this forum They're not smarter than you or I, not at all. They're, many of them, they're what we call insecure overachievers, people who like to um, get 
perfect grades, so to speak. So to do things in a manner that they get applause from their superiors or from others, from society, you name it. And this doesn't um, make, yeah, this doesn't um, make them very creative people, I think. And so also in, in these terms, of course, there are all those billionaires, but they don't, you, you see it already now, they, they, they don't cooperate, all of them. And if everybody, th those people who want to be the biggest gorilla in the room, they have a problem in cooperating always. And that's our chance, I think. Mm. Yeah, that's our big, yeah. Well, the, the, the it's, it's funny. Is it very interesting to observe how much the World Economic Forum now resides in public, in the public consciousness? Mm. Because yeah. even three, four, five years ago, the, I think most people wouldn't have heard of it. But now, uh, quite a large number of people know who Klaus Schwab is, and mm -hmm. he's he's like the evil dick. He's a he's the boogeyman. They, yeah, they've really labelled him as the boogeyman, which. So in my must, world, that means it's not the boogeyman. It's not him. There yeah. must be other people in the dark yeah, right. who managed uh, <laughs> to put Klaus Schwab in such a bad light. No, I think it's just people. And when when we look back at the World Economic Forum in, in the earlier days, I think they were attacked by uh, anti, so-called Antifa. Uh, by really? the Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, we still have old uh, bumper stickers in, in where I live in near Zurich, um, which say, yeah... Um, Next year, again, World Economic Forum, let's attack them in Davos. Um, well, yeah, yeah, Davos, right. Davos, yes, Davos that was 20 years back, and, and, and Antifa and the Black Bloc, or whatever they call themselves, they, they, they attacked them, and then they integrated, more or less. Um, yeah, the, the, the World Economic Forum defended itself by... Um, <clears throat> by cooperating with a certain part of the Antifa agenda, I guess. That's, that's how they defended themselves, so, yeah, how, how they managed this. And, in uh, what uh, sense? That's interesting. How, how, do you, how did they integrate in...? Oh, in that they also opposed uh, the evil right, yeah, the, the right wing. Um, right. I yeah, free mean. migration is great. World Economic Forum in the old days was just, I think, a couple of, of, of business leaders and politicians coming together in order um, to get some great crony deals, etc., yeah, <laughs> to be corrupt um, uh, in, <laughs> in their normal lives. And then this whole ethical uh, umbrella which they erected, that came over the last 20 years only, I think. And this was... Of course, Klaus Schwab always had this concept of stakeholder capitalism, whereby he means that um, yeah, power freaks get more of a say <laughs> in, 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 in free business world. But um, the, the flavor um, through which this um, uh, had to come about, I think this was added only after all these attacks by Antifa and, and other left-wing people. And then they integrated more or less with their But what do, you, what, what do you think is compelling the World Economic Forum, just powerful interests and maintaining those interests. It's great to come together with other big dogs. Yeah. yeah. But like I mean, you said, they, they, they struggle to all work together. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. In some areas, I think they work brilliantly together. When it comes to COVID mandates, for example, I think this was a great win for them, for some of them. For some of them. But where, Not take, for all of them, of Take course. that, for yeah. example. Yeah. Because... Um, why did people like that? Like what it, 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 in, uh, what it triggers in me is it makes me think that these people have a certain animosity for the sort of common person. But that's probably, that's a bit of a meme, isn't it? That's like the Klaus Schwab's an evil guy and he wants to put everyone in a box, uh, lock everyone up and, and mm. make them eat terrible food or whatever. Um, so, but what is it? What is it about those kind of people like that? They all came together and decided that lockdowns were a good idea. Right? What What is it about the powers that be that decided? Because um, there were obviously people that thought lockdowns were a good idea. Yeah. Um, but but it's not instinctive to, to no. want to lock people down. Not in my world, anyway. No, and it took a couple of weeks, right? Even the German government in the beginning, I remember. Um, the conspiracy theorists were those who warned against COVID in the early first two weeks. And then they made a 180 degree turnaround and uh, yeah, why? <laughs> everything changed. That's a good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> we did the same in the UK. We had a, we had mm. Boris was the pre um, prime yeah. minister. And initially he was very much, let's 
take it on the chin. Mm. We've just got to face this thing and get over it. And then he apparently got COVID. And then within a week, it was like, no, we need to. Mm. It was almost like in unison. And obviously, I know yeah. it's well known that the World Economic Forum have assets, let's call them. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not even, they don't even keep, they, they say this out loud. You know, we penetrate governments yeah, or yeah, whatever absolutely. it is. It's like, yeah, so yeah. It, it's hard not to look at that and go, okay, it, there is some kind of a conspiracy there. There is, there is, a, there is a group of people in, a, in an office all saying, right, we need to get our assets in governments and then we can kind of get what we want. And they were the ones, yeah. presumably, when you look at who locked down the most, mm. there was a connection, I think, at least, with, yeah. with people like the World Economic Forum, those like Canada, you know, Trudeau. Absolutely. Just, you know, yeah, 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 Macron. Um, yeah, Macron as yeah. well, you know. Yeah. Anyone that went to the G8, basically, <laughs> uh, you know, and they all, they obviously all went in step with each other. Now, that there's either a conspiracy or it isn't, you know, because um, I don't quite understand why. Yeah, I, I don't know what a cons... Actually, I, I've always struggled with this word. Why not call it cooperation? They just cooperate. Okay. Yeah. But why oh, cooperate? Yeah. Hmm. Why not cooperate on giving people as many freedoms as possible? Oh, yeah, yeah. This because, I mean. yeah, again, maybe... Uh, I don't know. Um, but maybe they're insecure overachievers and they thought that the best they could do is to be the most authoritarian because we saw China had it under control and Italy didn't and the people died in Italy. So it was about life and death and we are the rulers anyway. So we are responsible to minimizing, for, for minimizing death and uh, the individual be damned and we have to yeah, manage everything. And uh, it, it's, it's really hard to... Um, to speculate about those minds i think it's, it's pretty pretty hard for us but um, there's something like a, the patriarchal mind i think which thinks uh, to be benevolent uh, thinks of itself that it is a bene bene benevolent force yeah. and we know that it isn't um yeah but it's so, always easier for people to i think it's very hard for people to act knowing that they're on the on the dark side on the wrong side so i think even those people like trudeau i think they are they they, they have a perspective or a vision of themselves that, which is positive and um if you i think if we understand their view of themselves we are we are we're much more successful than just labeling them as something they don't want to be yeah well it sounds then like the whole political mechanism is flawed oh yeah because it attracts the wrong kind of people to be in oh yeah positions of power but yeah. how does that work then but that's not a very evolutionarily satisfying uh, thing for the human species is no it? Like, no but that's okay but that's where we come back to <laughs> human human the basics of human action and we argue in an article in the quarterly journal of Austrian economics and also in the appendix of my book that um, that's the basic flaw of our current society that we try to enforce um, <clears throat> to to reduce we try to reduce theft and robbery and um, and vandalism through an entity which is, uh, of course, it's a cratic entity which is based on force, yeah, and on non-voluntary interaction, namely the state, which gets all its resources through taxation, which is and, and yeah, and forces um, things that nobody has ever signed. And of course, people knew that there was an ethical elephant in the room, and then came Rousseau, who claimed, "Ah, but we have a social contract." Well, no, we don't, and the contract is not an entity which or a thing which can be changed by one side only, and not by the other party to the contract. But that's what the legal body is about, yeah. Um, and and uh, I think this is a basic flaw. And even the uh, how did, did they call them, John Locke, etc., the liberal constitutionalists of the 80s uh, and early 19th century. I think they had many many great um, <clears throat> great thoughts and. Um, uh, human rights uh, are a great concept, but uh, if you if you have one entity which can change the rules of the game and uh, yeah unilaterally and enforce everybody to adhere to it, you of course have the greatest basis for corruption that you can imagine. Yeah? But is is that a flaw in the human experience then, or is that is that something to be overcome? Yeah, or is that just the way it is, and it's an no? Flow? That's something to be overcome, and I think we have a huge spectrum already now, or we in, throughout history we had a huge spectrum of uh, of societies of the quality of um, 
yeah, the manner in that people live together. And why not improve a bit further? Why not? I mean, we have improved in technology. We have improved in leaps and bounds over the centuries. Why, why can't we um, improve in terms of living together? And, and I think the American experiment was already a step in that direction. And people had a new, a new world, a new area where to settle. And, and they improved in, in, in quite a lot of areas in the US in the, in the early uh, decades <clears throat> or centuries even. And then now it deteriorated and we have to learn from this. But, but that's my point. Hmm. It, even the, even the, the, you know, the American experiment deteriorated, deteriorated oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. into this yes. same thing. I mean, I'm thinking we about can... how when you, when you study how the state evolves, mm. it's a very normal and natural ex thing to even, evolve. Oh, absolutely. And even with a great set of, let's say, 5,000 free cities spread across the world, etc., we can never be sure... Um, Uh, that it won't deteriorate because this is, as I said, it's humans' free will. If if, if people become bored, uh, yeah, and the freedom or liberty becomes boring, then then things will all deteriorate. Right, so how do we yeah. mitigate that risk then? You can't. You can't. We, we, no. Well, how, all right. I, I, how do you? What do you? Well, what do you? You must be able to do something. To, to, oh, yeah. to, to, what do you do? So through through our lifetime, I think we can do what what we are doing here, and uh, yeah. Um, But in a way, we propagate freedom. But in a way, certainly from my perspective, I, I like the ideas of free cities being an experiment in governance. And I, the more the merrier and the more diverse the merrier as well, mm -hmm. which is fine. But, but I could easily argue that that will just end up the same scenario that, that happened to America. Or, you know, we'll always end up with a centralized force ending up realizing that it's, it's paid to protect f property rights and then in the end because it's the only one that's allowed to actually use force it realizes well i don't i don't need to answer to anyone here yeah. and that's always going to happen isn't it like how in what system does that not end up happening you know in, in the free city system as well and i'm not saying that that mm. that's not you know that's not a reason to not create yeah. free cities of course it's just a reason to realize that this is a an ebb and a flow it's the breath of culture or, or mm. you know governance breathes in and out just like everything else and then you know yeah but every every time uh, in uh, every cycle is, is somewhat different and our cycle is certainly a lot different from the medieval ages or from ancient rome or, or you name it and um, and that you can leverage i guess yeah uh, this is a, <laughs> the uh, the dimension on which you can improve um that Uh, when when freedom comes back, and, and maybe we are there already, and uh, yeah, some some prom promising developments I think around the world here and there, and if if that's the case, um, then let's do it better than the last time. Yeah. I mean, you could uh, easily, mm. but it, it, we, I think this is not the point in time in history where we now can do things right, and from there on everybody will live in paradise. This is. This would be an illusion. Uh, agreed. But but if you look, I mean, I, <clears throat> this just occurred to me now, and I, I haven't really thought this one through, but if you, th if you look back at the history of um, governance, isn't it just one long round of people finding a frontier, mm -hmm. having a good time for a certain amount of time, and then being overrun by the state, and then leaving and finding a new frontier mm -hmm. and doing it over and over again? And now we're at that point where... The, 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 the remaining frontiers are the sea, possibly, and now space. And then once we hit space, when we've got this infinite number of new frontiers, potentially. But, is I mean, you could argue that that's what happens. So why bother trying to resist that? Why? Because mm. there are no frontiers left currently, are there, really? In, in, in physical... Uh, on, in the physical on the land, world. On land. On I mean, land. I mean, in space and out at sea, I think there are, but... Mm. What do you think about that? Is that, is that me being a pessimist? <clears throat> No, I think you're right. You're right. Um, on the other hand, when there was no land to conquer, you still had freedom movements in the medieval ages. And, and so maybe maybe not as successful, you're right. But now you have uh, the informational dimension, so people can move part of their personality into a space that they can protect against the state through cryptography, you name it. But the reason yeah. they didn't have movement in the Middle Ages, in mm. movement passes, was... Because they didn't have the infrastructure to implement them, but they—I mean—they yeah. had movement passes at the gates to the city, I presume. It's just, you know, yeah. 
which is we just now like i say we have the technology now to enforce incredible well i say we i'm not doing it we have someone has the power to enforce incredible um restrictions on people through algorithms through artificial intelligence which basically does away with the need to have bureaucrats in an office mm. doing all this stuff it's like they'll give you a phone and a credit yeah. score and and your score will dictate what you can and can't do it's an, it's an amazingly oppressive idea that oh yeah absolutely that, that, that almost certainly will come into being in some shape or form yes 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 however i mean uh, the algorithms can only enforce in the informational world they cannot enforce in the physical world in well, our, no. yeah 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 but then they, they need a robot not necessarily i mean you know if i can't buy a, a plane ticket mm -hmm. because i don't have a good enough carbon score or a good enough credit uh, because yeah. i've been a bad a bad uh, well, you know, well, citizen well. then then that's mm -hmm. pretty damning for me i can't move can i yeah well but still you need the police um because not being able to buy a plane ticket means that the um plane operator is not allowed to sell you this ticket right But the plane operator could still sell you the ticket. And if there is no policeman enforcing it, it would happen. Pretty simple. And, and then you board this his, his or her plane and you yeah, fly away. I think that, yeah, I, and the algorithm sits on, on his server and, and true, is angry. <laughs> we, aren't we on a, a trajectory of passing over authority to algorithms and away from the police? Once yeah, it's yeah. like it's, 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 not, it's not force. It's not pa uh, force. It's... Uh, um, What's the word? Uh, But you know, if, if that was expected possible. Expected force or something. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. What's it called? No, when you abstract. It's abstract, abstract yeah, power. Yeah. It's In inherent power, whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the algorithm has abstract power. Mm -hmm. It's literally stopping me from leaving my home without actually doing anything. There's no one with a big stick saying, don't But, leave your house. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. But that weapon could be turned around and we construct an algorithm which prevents politicians from, <laughs> from taxing us. <laughs> well, hopefully. But I don't yeah. know how to do that myself. Mm. Do you? Well, Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> It's a step in that direction, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, no, honestly, that, that's, yeah. Hmm. Things are moving fast and it's it's easy, I think, to be uh, to become highly pessimistic or highly optimistic. And at the end of the day, when you when you look at history, uh, it's always been about the decision of people because at the end of the day, humans were, were still the most powerful entity on the world. Maybe, maybe this changes now. I don't know, but... Um, in that case, we have to make use of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, and play the game. Okay. Better than the other side. Well, yes, yes. But it does become a bit tiresome after a while. Mm, and true. that's my experience anyway. Yeah, that's um, true. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Mark, um, we're, we're running over time here. I've, um, I think it's probably time to end this conversation. But um, your, your talk is... Your talk at the conference is literally management of political risk. Right? I will, yes, exactly. And, and uh, yeah, my, my teaser is uh, what did uh, John Galt tell the other entrepreneurs? We know what he talked, uh, he talked about to Hank Reardon, but we don't know about all the others. And Hank is a very emotional guy, but maybe there were some very, let's say, um, unemotional, very factual guys. And um, I think John Gild always adapted his message. So that's, that's what my book is about. <laughs> well, thanks for talking to us today. And um, I look forward to seeing you on stage. And um, thanks for coming in. Thanks, Tim. What a pleasure. Mm -hmm.